the way there is lack of information in the communities and out there. So the Stop Plastic Pollution campaign addresses this lack of information and what actually causes the waste mismanagement in our communities. We leverage on technology, the Baustaka app and a USSD code, um, uh, USSD platform. We also uh, ensure that we are in the communities. We piloted in the heart of um, Old Town community because there is a problem of mixed waste mixing with sewage, unfortunately going directly into the Indian Ocean, which is so, so sad. So we started this Stop Plastic com uh, Pollution campaign raising awareness in the community and in collaboration with Mombasa County Department of Environment, we have onboarded more than 600 households who are segregating at source. Can I get a round of applause, please? Thank you. So you see, from being told you can't do anything, this is going to fail to getting to where we are. And in fact, when we started um, the Stop Plastic Pollution campaign sometime in June, we had the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi reach out to us and say, you're doing great work on the ground. We want to come and actually see this in person. And after that, within three weeks, we were invited to the UN complex in Nairobi to exhibit the Stop Plastic Pollution campaign to the US Secretary of State and White House, of, uh, White, White House officials from Washington, DC. So you see how your passion, you see how your passion for the environment and the community well-being is actually leading you to get to, you know, global platforms where more people can learn about what you're advocating for. So I think I've spent enough time on that. Yeah, thank, thank you, so, you. Thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause for her. And I can say that Dr. Taiba, you are doing an incredible job in trying to protect the marine ecosystem. And uh, I'll go to our next panelist, uh, Bosco Juma. You are also doing an incredible job in trying to protect the ecological aspect of our marine. And you are so passionate about the mangrove and everything that involves the sea, the sea forest, that is, that's the mangrove. So I know that it hasn't been an easy journey for you. Uh, what will you consider to be the main challenge that you have encountered in this work? Starting up as a young community leader to where you are. How have you managed to bring the community and to rally the young people towards the course that you have taken? Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, uh, first I'll start by saying uh, one of the main challenges that uh, we always experience working in the mangrove ecosystem. Uh, first, by the way, uh, uh, in two, 2010 is when I sp f uh, planted the first mango. So yeah, I'm talking of 14 years of being in this ecosystem. Hmm. While we are talking of a decade of restoration, I'm reflecting of more than a decade of restoration. So one of the challenges that I've experienced is inclusivity. And uh, this comes in because of, um, I don't want to call it marginalization, but profiling of, of, of young people and of communities. And uh, when you talk about community, you might think it is someone else out there. But I'm just talking of women and youth, and especially uh, those who want to be there, but there is no one speaking for them. Uh, that challenge comes in because of the uh, systemic issues that are existing. Uh, first, uh, you can remember that uh, it is just 2010 that we had our constitution. So there are so many factors that are legal related, some are cultural related, that make young people not to be out there. R right now you can talk about mangrove and it can be hard, but do a flashback of 10 years ago and you realize you could be speaking to yourself, uh, telling people about mangrove. I think that was the main challenge that I can refer to as, uh, as a young person having experience in the mangrove ecosystem. Okay, thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause for Bosco. <laughs> Most people don't know the importance of the mangrove forest. Uh, and uh, from my little research, mangrove plays an integral role in the carbon sink absorption that helps in purifying of the air. So you are doing a great job. And uh, now that you've thrown it back to me, it's apparent that the only way out for young people is either to entrepreneurship, either through action, but most importantly, through innovation. And uh, when you talk about innovation, we can't talk about innovation as young people without mentioning the name of Purity Gakuo. 
So purity is helping combat the food insecurity in the context of climate change and the dwindling pr produced through the solar-powered uh, freezer that she came up with uh, through the Kusa. That's the name of the company, that the enterprise that she's using, the Kusa freezer, uh, freezers. So purity, why did you create the innovation? That's the first question. And uh, what do you think is the place of innovation in trying to build up a resilient coast youth network that uh, will combat this, this, uh, this menace that is created by the climate threat? And uh, is Kusa doing anything to increase participation of the young people? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to first introduce Kusa Freezer. So Kusa Freezer is a youth-led startup that is based in Mombasa was founded or rather started in the year 2020. 2020 was uh, a near where we did our research. We also uh, uh, pro um, um, produced our first products, also the piloting phase. And then we officially registered in 2021. So what we do is uh, we co-founded uh, this company with Dennis Onkangi, who is my co-founder. And our sole aim was to improve food security and promote economic resilience of the fishing communities here in Mombasa, in Kenya, and Sub-Saharan Africa at large, using uh, climate mass solutions. So how this uh, solution came about? Uh, it's uh, through the interaction, uh, our interaction with the small-scale fishers here in Mombasa, and also in uh, Wasini Island, where we actually started um, uh, with our piloting phase. We learned that these people are facing a number of challenges in their day-to-day -day business operations. And for us, post-harvest losses stood out. So we realized that the small-scale fishers are making huge post-harvest fish losses. And this was because they lack access to affordable and reliable cold storage solutions. And I'd like us to dig deeper and understand this challenge. So the UN estimates that we have about um, 1.3 billion tons of food, which is equivalent to a third of world's uh, production, goes to our trash cans as rubbish. That is food that was supposed to be consumed, but all that goes to waste before it can be consumed. Yet, more than 10% of humanity is suffering from malnutrition. Now, that's such a huge imbalance. Why are we losing food and the people who are starving? Again, this has an effect to our environment. This means that uh, the greenhouse gases from the food industry alone um, accounts for up, up to 30% of the total emissions. That is what we call a climate crisis. Now, what are we doing about this Escusa freezer? We are manufacturing solar-powered freezers and offering them on a very affordable and sustainable pay-as-you-go model, uh, or rather a lease-to-own model, which is um, a model that enables these um, users of ours to uh, use our product and pay pole pole. So we were able to introduce um, the static version of our product, which is basically a 100 liter freezer. We have from 60 to 150 liters. And then it has a solar panel, solar battery. We do um, full installation. And then we realize that these people, again, do not have, uh, because if you go machinani, these people do not have access to lighting. So to counter, there is no way somebody has a freezer at home or at their workplaces, and they do not have uh, access to lighting. It doesn't make sense. Freezer is. If you compare a freezer, a freezer and lighting, this is a freezer, we can say a freezer is more like a luxury and uh, lighting is basic need. So we decided to offer lighting as now a free package for these people. So again, we realized that the rural um, fishing communities are also facing another challenge. Most of their markets are in town. Most people who buy their fish are in Mombasa town. But these people are in Mashinani, they do not have a way of bringing their fresh fish from where they are in their rural areas or from fishing to the market. So we um, introduced a mobile version, which is, um, we have a 100 liter freezer, which is uh, fully solar powered, installed on a three-wheeled uh, tricycle. Uh, it has its own uh, solar panel mounted on top, which also serves as a, uh, as a shade to the rider. We ha it has uh, enough storage uh, for the rider as well, and then it has an inbuilt battery. So it's, it's um, a whole cold storage solution uh, on the go. So we also um, introduced another mobile version, which is um, um, an, um, an electric 
motor, motorcycle, wiki wiki, motorcycle, that um, is almost similar to the trikes, only that these can cover longer dista distances. So we realize that now this is going to solve the problem these people are having because even if they have now the freeze at their, at their workplaces and their bigger market is in town, we need to bring a solution whereby they are able to transport fre fresh fish from where they are all the way to the market. So uh, we currently are in um, Mombasa. We are based in Mombasa. Our, our workshop is in Bamburi. You're always welcome to visit. And uh, we currently launched um, a center in uh, Siaya County. We are looking to open one in Kisumu as well and Turkana. Um, those are some of the milestones we are hoping to achieve before the end of the year. And um, since um, 2020, around 2021 November, that's when I would say we went to the market and uh, got our first product out. And uh, we've been able to uh, impact the lives of about 1,200 small-scale fishers in Sierra County and in uh, Mombasa as well. So I would say, yes, innovation is uh, how we are going to find our way through and save our environment. And I believe the youths are very creative. We are energetic, uh, energetic. Our minds are always racing, thinking of ideas, thinking of how we can make um, um, our lives better in various ways. And we have all been affected by climate change in so many ways irrespective of which industry you're working at, irrespective of whether you're an entrepreneur or you're employed or whatever, we are all affected by it. And this means that we should all take action. Just like um, the Together Climate theme. We are all affected by it. We should all also contribute to uh, bringing the change that we need. So yes, innovation is how we are going to find our way through this. And th we have amazing organizations already that are doing um, magic. I mean, we have uh, Ms. Boss with Bostaka doing an amazing job and congratulations for the work you're doing. So yes, innovation is how we are going, no matter how, how small we are as startups or we are all creating impact in our own, way, own ways. And uh, I would like to also recognize KC, KCIC, Kenya Climate Innovation Center, because they are doing a great job with uh, equipping us, the youth, because I've also benefited from that, equipping the youth with knowledge, skills, and also uh, networks, and learning how we can make our environment uh, more safer and making our businesses green. So as Kusa Frieza, we have created a space where we engage with other entrepreneurs, other youths in the community, in the tech startup community, and um, we share ideas, we brainstorm on how we can make each other's businesses green because um, I might be thinking of a solution, I might be thinking of something that I can try and implement in my business, but when we come together as uh, youths in the startup community, we are able to sit down and analyze your business well and share ideas on how maybe we can replace this, maybe we can reuse this, maybe we can reduce this. So that's how we are helping each other build um, the startup ecosystem and even make our businesses green and eventually save our environment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm so impressed uh, with what you've said, that innovation is the way to go for the youth. You know, I was doing my own re uh, we, we were doing our own research with Basil under uh, this tag of the Together for Climate. And we realized that uh, Ghana, as a country, is leading in terms of intervention of youth in combating these climate issues through innovations. And uh, one thing that came out is that we, the young people, have unique characteristics like our strength and uh, we are learned we have the opportunity to think and come up with, with innovations and also this is our generation we must be responsible so if you can stand up and uh, do what uh, purity has done what bostak has done and what bosco is doing either through entrepreneurship either through innovation we need to have a stake and change this future that is ahead of us so we have heard from the private sector and now we want to hear from the government because uh, we can't move as young people or as an entity without the input of the government. So we have Waziri Emily, who is here together with us. I know she had a busy schedule during the afternoon, but uh, I want to thank you for creating time to be here. I know how busy you are. And uh, we are so proud as young people from this island, especially me, having grew up together with you, uh, to be here and uh, to have you as the... The, the person who is in charge of climate in this island. So as the lead, and we have seen you leading this thing before even uh, joining the government, you had your own organization that was doing 
great initiative that have have some impact uh, in this generation and the generation that is to come. So Waziri, these young people cannot thrive without a supporting policy. Uh, and this regime, we are looking at uh, policies that shall help this youth. So are there any plan for policy prevention or intervention to encourage young action, young people to stand up for climate change at local level or at county level? Are there any plan, uh, fiscal plan, because uh, we need the laws uh, to insensitize our youth to take up climate action, especially for the green enterprise in the economy? Thank you. Thank you, Baraka, for that. Uh, first, allow me to um, share my uh, gratitude to Dr. Taiba. I think I have used her as, as an example in most of the sessions that I talk to the youth without telling her she's, she's an inspiration to me because uh, first she's a doctor, but then her solutions are more on waste management. And this tells us that uh, uh, you don't need to innovate around your industry or your career. We are being told that environment is, is a project for all of us to implement. And therefore, wherever you are, if you look, if you look at the challenges that are facing us as, as a county or as a country, as young people, innovation is at the center of everything. And therefore, you are able to, to come up with solutions that can be scalable, that can be uh, implemented to protect the environment. Uh, coming back to the question of uh, policies and the environment where young people can actually innovate and make uh, contribution in climate change, I think as a department, we currently have the climate change policy, which went through a very participatory and consultative approach. And uh, it took into consideration the youth and women and, and, and uh, non-state contribution in it. And therefore, it's, it's the broader, uh, it provides a broader, broader environment where we can have a resilient county. But still, uh, currently, we are looking to developing uh, the climate change uh, bill and the climate change fund bill. We also have a renewable energy bill and natural resource management regulations. I think all of these four oh, bills are going to speak into the work that youth need to do to contribute to the, a resilient county. And therefore, we are still at the initial stages. We will be talking to every stakeholder uh, and getting their opinion to ensure that the policies that the county sets will provide an environment that is conducive for innovations. Uh, speaking about also the infrastructure is that as a, as a county, we realize that uh, there's a gap in terms of climate education. And therefore, they are, we, we are engaging uh, different partners to uh, increase awareness. We currently have sub-county climate uh, change uh, officers. They, uh, they are in each sub-county. They are, are supposed to conduct community-based um, awareness. And we hope to increase that in the next uh, coming year and have uh, an officer at ward level because the approach that we want to take is, I know he mentioned bottom up. Uh, that's the, ideally that's how we want to look at it. We talk to the community, we agree on the possible um, projects that can be implemented to support the area. Because if you look at Mombasa, we are first, we are an island and we are an economic hub. So the way climate change affects us is different uh, in how it affects the, the different counties. And for us, we have to relate the impact to livelihood. And that, that would be the easier way for people to understand and see, I am in transport, climate change is affecting me in transport, and therefore, these are kind of innovations that we need to do. So even in our messaging, we are very deliberate to, to see that it speaks to the livelihood of our people, and therefore they are able to, to relate to it and, and adjust to the changes. Uh, there's also the issue of uh, culture and lifestyle, because most of what we need to do, even about segregation, about our consumption, 
our, our production, our day-to-day -day habits that would uh, support this sustainable future has to do with our way of life. And you know you cannot change that overnight. But we are trying to see that the, the, the conversation also revolves around the Mombasa that was there, the current Mombasa, and the future that we are looking at, so that everyone knows that this climate emergency is not just for the county or global at, at COP. It is here with us, and everyone has a role to do. Lastly is on climate mainstreaming. Uh, like I have just mentioned that climate change affects all sectors and as a department we want to ensure that our uh, colleague CECs in their departments also understands how climate change is affecting them so that even in their planning they are able to factor in an element of climate change and therefore we are increasing climate advocates and, and ensuring that the financing bit that um, would go into mitigation and adaptation programs is not only from the Department of Water and Natural Resource and Climate Change. Even in transport, in trade, and in, in health, there is, there is a component of climate change. Um, the, we, we are currently doing this, our special plan. If you look at the draft that is out, there, there, there is an element of uh, an overall planning that is uh, considered, considers the, the climate change impact. And I think that's a good thing, even as the county is looking at zoning and, and uh, providing incentives for industries, it is considering the clean and green enterprising. And therefore, that would uh, be able to help um, entrepreneurs like uh, Dr. Taiwa and, and Purity to, to get their foot. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Waziri. Uh, that was quite elaborate. Uh, uh, for now, I'll open up the floor for the audience. When we were planning this roundtable, we wanted this last engagement to be an engagement between the, the general public and the young people who are seated on this panel so that they can help us in trying to shape the future and the energy around these young people to align towards the goals that we have as a nation on the NDC and the climate uh, achievement that we want to achieve. So I'll open up the floor for the young people who are here to ask questions to my panelists so that they might answer as we proceed. Good evening. Okay, I'm um, Hadija, and my question goes to, I think it applies to all the speakers, like when you look at Baustaka, Kuza Freezer, and Big Ship, these are success stories from innovative ideas. So as youth, you are uh, our role models, and these success stories motivate us, and also we like for your opinions on maybe what kind of set skills should these SMEs look into or factor in so that they can help the, their groups or their ideas scale up. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Uh, I'm Kelvin of Fulo Anjala. I would like to direct my question to Waziri. Okay, Waziri, for the, for the past 10 years, actually from the, from the last regime, first and early year, we have witnessed that there was uh, illegal dumping and there were, there were no measures. Actually, I can say poor measures, were, poor measures that were there to handle the issue of garbage collection. So, and you, you have been close to the com community that's good. That's the good thing with you. You're, you've been working very close with the community. So, what are some of these mitigation measures your your ministry has come up with, in cooperation with the with the NEMA and the national government, to ensure that the uh, the issue of garbage is dealt with and for and for long, because we live among the the people who are very ignorant 
you can't advise them. So what are some of these mitigation measures that you have come up with? Um, good afternoon. My name is Joyce Quetch, um, and I am a climate activist. Um, uh, my question is um, to uh, Madam Emily. Um, as a climate activist, um, we often attend conferences or um, either conferences in the country or outside the country. And as climate activists, we are always um, pushing for climate finance because Africa is only responsible for 3% of the emissions. And of course, it's always a demand of, you know, um, we need climate finance so that it can help us with, you know, the droughts and everything. So as a young person who has a small CBO, just like Bosco, who is um, um, planting mangroves, we are also in the sector of planting mangroves. And one of our challenges is, of course, um, and I think Mr. Bosco will agree with me, is finances. Because um, we are being able to plant almost um, more than 20,000 seedlings, but it has been you know, a struggle just to um, reach to that point. So, um, and we know- uh, Department of Water, with the Department of Lands, and all the other departments involved to ensure that when somebody is constructing a building or a residential area, that all these sewage are channeled to the proper or a channel to a proper way so that they, should, they, they cannot end up in the ocean. Thank you. I think that's the last question we shall take for now. Uh, thank you so much, Gloria. Uh, as you can uh, analyze the question that were coming, they were mostly pointed to our Waziri, our young Waziri that we are proud of. So I'll begin with her as she tries to answer to those young brains that question, ask her questions. Uh, thank you for those questions. I think I'll start with the last one. Um, was on the interdepartmental relations and how we work together to ensure that um, the, the, the implementation of the policies that are set is, is done. One, I think we, we have agreed in principle the, 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 as a cabinet that uh, all issues that are uh, are cross-cutting, we have a liaison person that will work with the other department to ensure that it's it's included in their in their plans. Number two, uh, there's uh, there's some changes in terms of approval of buildings, and now every department has uh, a person that uh, sits in that approval committee. F for us, we look at the on-site solutions that have provided by the uh, investor, but even more, we have specification that for this kind of housing, this is what you require. So I think what will remain is, is enforcement, and, and that will, you will, will be seen very soon, because even the inspectorate is undergoing some transformation that will see them being uh, efficient. Number three is on the illegal dumping. I know that's within the Department of Solid Waste uh, Management. Uh, I'm sure the DG touched on something in the morning, but even so, if you have been around, you've noticed that they have closed almost all illegal dumping uh, sites, and now there's, there's some order on how Waste management is done in Mombasa. There was training for the groups that uh, uh, collect from the household level. We have this Solid Waste Management Act that we are trying uh, collectively with stakeholders to see how it can be implemented. Uh, we have material recovery facilities. I uh, know Bosco can talk more about that, that we are piloting uh, at every sub-county to ensure that there are collection points and then there are recovery facilities and they end up to our landfill in, in Mwakirunge. So there are some changes that are happening, but as we talked earlier, we need um, citizens to segregate at source. We need that mindset shift to ensure that the value chain can be exploited. And number three is on um, 
uh, financing. I think it was mentioned that most youth that are in uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, we only end up in conferences and you hear about uh, climate change funds at, at international level. For me, I would look at it in twofold. There is the, that fund that is set aside from um, global uh, level, but then we have been talking about green uh, and clean enterprise. And even in our local area, you, you, even in financial institutions, you'll find now there is um, a, a facility that supports uh, entrepreneurs that are in green financing, which is part of climate financing. If you look at our development partners that support non-state actors, they have moved from big organizations. They are now looking at um, uh, small organizations that are doing something with the community. Even if it's going to be uh, in a consortia model that you will also benefit. For me, I am looking at what you're presenting. What's the innovative idea that you're bringing on board? And we talked about if it is, if you are able to scale the idea or it is at ideation stage. So more of that will uh, we'll see us uh, interest partners, both locally and, and at national level, uh, to, to be able to, to put these ideas into, into practice. And even as a county, I know for youth, we have the revolving fund, which is supposed to support um, as businesses. This is one platform that we can look at and say a percentage of it will go towards supporting uh, programs that are into adaptation and mitigation. And then we have another quarter uh, for maybe a, a different uh, target group. So uh, mostly is about getting the information, I, uh, understanding where these partners are and presenting your idea. I like what Swahili Port is doing. They have this pitching session for, for young entrepreneurs. And mostly, I know nowadays, Thursday is for solid waste. Then they have the other days. These are also platforms where we can get to meet uh, the financiers and also meet our fellow youth that can input on our ideas. Like it was said, you, you don't need to to present it uh, and maybe you can talk to Dr. Taiba uh, and she can add value to your ideas. So let's be each other's ambassador. If you know someone has a great idea and you hear of these platforms, you can uh, um, ensure that you share the information, they participate, and we see uh, how we can all support each other. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and before Dr. Taiba respond to the question. No question. There is a question about skill sets from, I think, Khadija. She was asking about what skill sets the youth can have. Okay. I want to just take two minutes and I'll tell you one of our trademark secrets. Leverage on partnerships and ensure you network, network, network. What has worked for Baustaka is we just don't partner with anybody. We look at where we have a skill set gap, and then we strategically uh, reach out to an organization that has maybe a lot of uh, either impact, or they have the funding, or maybe they have the skill sets as well. We look for them, and we partner with them. So they will capacity build you so that you can get that skill set. I hope that helps. OK, thank you. As, uh, as we conclude this great uh, panel discussion. I would like us now to have a parting shot uh, from each of you. Uh, and as you'll be giving the, the parting shot, we would like to hear from you uh, guys, whatever that you're doing, the enterprises that you guys are running. What's the stake uh, do the youth have? How will you support them? Uh, how, how can you pull them up? Because we have heard that youth have role models but role models are the only people that you look up to.
they need mentors, guys who can hold their hands. So as you'll be giving your part in short, your closing remark, I want you to capture that so that they may get any commitment from you people. So I'll begin with you, Bosco, going in that way up to Waziri will close up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before uh, I conclude my parting shot on how young people can engage, uh, I wish to respond to the question, especially because uh, I work with young people. I do a lot of career guidance, and my background is also human resource, so I deal with personnel a lot. And uh, one key thing that I talk to young people about is about leadership. And leadership starts with the personal leadership, and it ends at the apex is stakeholder engagement or partnership because you need to lead yourself, you need to lead your colleague, you need to manage your, your team ego, and then you need to manage stakeholders. And all that, the bottom line is partnership. And uh, to the second question of waste management, which is an area which I passionately engage in, uh, one thing I can say about waste management, it can only work and it will only work if, one, the laws are effectively implemented, two, if institutions and partnership within institution are meaningful. And three, and Waziri mentioned, I mean, uh, the, the DG mentioned it in the beginning, and he talked about people and attitude and their culture. If we can work on our culture, I think if we can work that journey, right from the laws which I appreciate right now, uh, we have our, our Waste Management Act and Bill, and that's a very important part of it. And what we are looking at is how implementation plan it is very important. With, uh, with a policy and a bill and without a, a framework, it's as good as nothing at the end of the day because whoever sits there will be like, now what? So apart from the policies and the institutions, I appreciate Mombasa currently. We have a lot of institutions that are in waste management, the WF, there's hand in hand, and the list is there. And that is, comes in with a meaningful partnership, not competition, meaningful partnership. And then how now the culture can be changed, which I believe awareness is the key. That is very important for us to change the, the narrative within our waste management uh, agenda here in Mombasa. And uh, in relation to waste man and to conservation and now the climate financing, which is an area which I work in, uh, we have a project that we call Adopter Site. And uh, in my advocacy in the, in the conservation of marine and mangrove conservation, it is interesting that Mombasa is the only county with a forest that has illegal liquor brewing within it and it has been there for a long time. More than 40 years, people have been brewing Chang'a in Mombasa. The way small Mombasa is, I remember uh, 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 the engineer was saying how Mombasa is very small for everything, but we have enough space for doing Chang'a within the forest. So I've done a bit of advocacy on that, and one of the challenges is changing the mindset, because if you mention it, people is like, that is people activity for conservationists. But I mean, it is affecting everyone. So uh, one challenge that, uh, uh, one thing that I can talk about for announcing on that, uh, we have come out from the language of tree planting. Tree planting is where as an organization we come with hundreds of thousands, you look for young people, you pay them money for buying some seedlings, and then you give them labor money for planting, and then you consider it done. And that is what we bring in the nature-based solution that we are talking about, which was the conversation in the morning, that nature-based solution is a solution that has a community, has a, has a lot of support to the community, and then it supports the biodiversity and people. So when you plant trees and you support biodiversity, and then you leave the people wallowing in poverty, then that's not nature-based solution. So what am I saying? Adopter site is where we are looking at nature-based solution from the angle of ensuring that you are leaving the community more sustainability programs within it. My parting shot, my parting shot uh, is going back again to the young people and climate change uh, agenda. And I want, and I, I'll just recall on what Bausi has, has said, young people need to take the space. Yeah. And I'll take you back, uh, currently we are, we are working still on ensuring that we have our nat national climate change action plan mm -hmm. and county climate change action plan. It is my belief and my prayer that the leadership in the county are going to integrate young people in that conversation. Why? Because we are putting long-term agenda. Remember, climate change is not a one-day uh, It's not an activity. It's, it's not an event. It's a long-term engagement. And where we'll be missing young people are in that conversation, then we realize that we'll be having no space to discuss in the future. Thank you. Okay. Uh, purity, 30 seconds. Well, I believe that youth, for youths to take action, we should all take action here. Because um, 
this change should come from our homes, should come from how we are living our lives. So sustainability should be our lifestyle. Let's pr practice secularity in our daily lives. We do not have to do the magic. We do not have to be experts in uh, climate change and all that and bringing the change. But we can all do something. From switching off the light when you're not using them, to sustainably using water, to, you know, uh, let's um, all do something. Let's all do something in our various capacities. Something else is that um, youths are not, are not, they are not just consumers of the change. We are also the contributors. We are invaluable contributors to the change that we need today. In our various capacities, we are all contributors. We all have the resources, no matter how small they are, we all have what it takes to bring the change that we all need. So let's equip our youths. Let's equip ourselves. Let's gather information, the right information, the right skills. Let's network and uh, get the right people to also uh, join the team because this is not a one-man job. We all need each other to move as a team so that we can get the change that we need. So as Kusa Frieza, we are practicing circularity, sustainability. Uh, so some of the materials that we use, we source them um, locally here in Kenya because we're also practicing local manufacturing. And uh, a, few, um, a few items that we are not able to get from Kenya, we source them outside. So one of the materials that we use that are environmentally friendly is uh, fiberglass. Our uh, freezers are made from uh, pieces of fiberglass, which is reusable, I mean recyclable, and it's also environmental friendly. So we are looking into, um, so the fiberglass um, makes our freezers very suitable for use in fishing boats because we know Mombasa is, uh, the water is very salty, so uh, metal is prone to, to rusting. So that, that's the reason why we use fiberglass, because it is very durable, uh, anti-rust, and it is also um, environmental friendly. Although, as we move, as we scale, we are looking forward to also um, maybe eliminating with uh, something even more sustainable uh, by recycling the waste that we, uh, we have in our, in our communities. And um, that is actually a plan that we are looking into. We want to get our machineries right, and get the right equipment because we know this is going to also um, even reduce ev not only cost but also um, make our products even more eco-friendly. So I would like us to take initiative, be the ambassadors. We all here have some information, maybe not all, but let's use social media. Social media is a very powerful tool and we all utilize various social media platforms for various reasons. Some of us for learning, entertainment and uh, whatever. But can we just make creating awareness one of the reasons why we logging into various social media pr platforms? I cannot be surprised that there are people, the youths, young people who have no idea what climate change is, do not know the activities that they do on a daily basis, how they affect our environment, and maybe the action that is supposed to be taken. But it's for us to take action. As much as we are implementing these actions, let's also carry our friends along. Let's use our social media spaces to to create awareness yeah. because we need to we need all of us so yeah let's also use our waste as the resources let's see opportunities where we are where we are calling the climate crisis let's all do something absolutely dr tiber briefly your parting shot <laughs> i'll use the parting shot that alex kubaso usually uses waste has value there are great opportunities in the green jobs uh, space now. Please take advantage. And also, please give me one more minute. We're building our BAUS EcoChamp movement that comprises of the youth to be at the forefront taking climate action. Please join the movement. At BAUS TAKA, we have an open door policy. Let's come together and take climate action. Thank you. Was there your parting shot? <laughs> you are on the receiving end in this panel discussion. I will try and take the 30 seconds. Um, first, I'll just start with what Purity has said. Let's practice secularity in all, in all that we do. Just the other day, we had floods, and everyone was asking me about water harvesting. And no one is talking about the water that they can save from their own consumption in the house. So even as we look at uh, policies at county level, we are encouraging everyone to just to reflect on their consumption and see how they can contribute in their little ways to a resilient county. Lastly is uh, for the youth. Uh, 
take, we are being told that if you take the road that is less traveled, you will leave a mark. I know this issue of self-doubt and, and naysayers that Dr. Taiba was talking about is a story that we can all relate with, but, there, um, but uh, we just need to be confident and believe in what we are doing and be consistent. So welcome to the Department of Water, Natural Resource and Climate Change Resilience. We have more plans that will involve the youth. Uh, I think we will be sharing in our platforms and if you visit us, you'll learn more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Waziri. And uh, I want to thank all of you, Bosco, Purity, Dr. Taiba and Waziri for your time. It has been a great deliberation that we have had. And my part in short is simply telling these young people that this is our generation the last generation fail, the first generation fail, but this generation must also fail at GLP and together for Climate Roundtable, it's youth-led and we shall continue partnering with partners that we have and we shall make sure that this generation will not fail, the generation that we have and the generation of our kids and grandkids. So without wasting much time, let's have a round of applause for the panelists. Uh, as I welcome Maureen to proceed with the remaining part. Young people, we need to take the central role. And as Dr. Terry has said, once you know your why, you know your way. Isn't it? Okay, so I want to invite all of you for tea after this session, where we can network more strategically and we can exchange more ideas. At this juncture, I want to invite Basil for our closing remarks and commitments. Thank you so much. Where's the energy? That was an incredible panel. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Young people doing incredible work across domains. And, and, and who can imagine it, it, it was Baraka's first uh, moderation session. <laughs> and this is, this is what we mean by encouraging young people to embrace the unfamiliar. Embrace the unfamiliar and, and, and just psych up to challenges. Take up the challenge and, yeah, he did well. And, and, and um, I'm so impressed that he got the best out of our uh, uh, panelists. So quick things that we, from this panel. And the biggest lesson that we are getting is that the next event should be entirely youth. Because all the folk who, who sat in front here have, have all left, most of them. So next time they sit the whole time and the young people run the show the whole time. So that they also get to listen to, to these perspectives from the young people. But the people who have stayed through are genuine supporters of young people. I've seen my old man, Engineer Keno, there. When, uh, he stayed through. And he was the first guy who gave me a chance when I got into the county government as an accountant, a junior accountant giving me different roles and just yeah, putting me in very uncomfortable situations, <laughs> high-level meetings that I didn't deserve to be in. Yeah, and whenever an opportunity came, he kept, or he kept on pushing me. Take it. Go. Yeah, even when it really looked quite unfamiliar. And I'm glad that now we are here and we are having this conversation. Uh, it's a youth-led conversation. Uh, we have seen a whole array of issues that youth are taking lead on uh, from combating climate, uh, marine litter, food security. Can I get a better mic? It should be a better mic. Perfect. Yeah. Food security and, uh, of course, guys doing ecosystem restoration and leading policy adjustments at, uh, in, in government and especially uh, the local government where this is really uh, be, 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 be driven from because that is a custodian of uh, policy. So I just wanted to maybe uh, pick quickly uh, what we would consider as the major takeaways from this event and what would uh, inform our next event because we, 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 there will be a third edition of this multi-sectoral roundtable. There will be a fourth one. And we don't want to see Baustaka 
Again, because if you don't step up, she'll be here every day. And last time she came in as a speaker. This time round, Bo Stucker walked into this event as a sponsor. And Purity came today as a speaker. Next year, we hope that is growth, yeah? And, and, and it shows that young people are really, are really making progress and we are, we, are, we are glad. So there's a bit of this uh, conference that has also not really uh, properly addressed, and that was exhibition. So we had an uh, all array of ex exhibitors right behind there. Some took advantage of the platform to also just show their, showcase the exhibition. But we have an exhibition that we wanted to highlight. And uh, before we move for tea, I would have uh, our friend there just get to tell us what he's doing in agribusiness so that we also just get to appreciate some of these young people that are uh, taking action at the community level to drive some of these uh, eco-inclusive enterprises. So as a wrap-up of uh, today's session, I'd want to invite unceremoniously though, I know I didn't prepare, but somebody who has been keenly uh, following this conversation throughout was part of our initial event and, and, and gave us immense support throughout that event. So Dr. Innocent Ngao, I want you to quickly, this, this year we are focusing on taking stock of, of the progress we are making and, and, and just really uh, tell us the key outcomes of this event and what we can really build uh, 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 onto as we proceed to the third multisectoral climate uh, dialogue. So just quickly, you have a minute. So, so we just summarize this and then we, we proceed. Do you have the summary written for me? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Basil. Uh, that's a, a good surprise. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I need another applause for the last panel. Really, the 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 team really made me proud. I I know quite a number of them physically. I met them here uh, during the other meetings. I met them some of them virtually. Uh, that's why you're being told to embrace. Uh, social media and all, all these other media. Uh, I was in since the beginning of this session and uh, last year as much as Basil is not saying we supported the activity, we actually supported, <laughs> we hosted the event last year and this year things didn't happen the way we wanted. We had talked with Basil that the youth sh should have this meeting in, was it? Was it Arusha? Alafu Mamba Yaka Ivi. So thank you so much, Basel. Uh, I really need to thank you and the GYLP for your energies. And um, the first thing that uh, um, I got from the initial introducers of the sessions, uh, right from the beginning, we, we had the opening remarks from the Danish embassy. It was critical that uh, we do embrace uh, training in uh, sustainable and circular economy and environment in general. So that's something that uh, we need to build up in the coming year and let us have trainings being done in strategic areas, uh, especially in uh, climate change and of course uh, nature-based solutions. And if you get stuck on nature-based, Alex is here. He, he has a whole program on nature-based uh, solutions and circular economy. Uh, the other thing that was very clear are uh, the, 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 the opening remarks from Dr. Is it Dr. Or Ogo and, uh, and Basil and even Dr. Taiba. Let us think about not compartmentalizing ourselves in our special areas. These are accountants, they are medics, they are in all these other fields, but they have a calling in environment and sustainable uh, circular economy. You can have a calling in any area and there are other people who can support you. Uh, I really like what she said about taking advantage of the networks you have. Most of us, if you come to our office, we give you the knowledge for free. For free, for, for you to initiate including the keynote speaker, 
uh, as much as you have your mentors, Dr. David Obura was my mentor. He met me when I was coming from university and I didn't know where to switch on the laptop. You know those days? <laughs> those days the computers were not there. Some of you found computers, for us computers found us. And uh, <laughs> he was teaching me how to start and so on and he was very patient. And then when I was already switching on the laptop, he taught me how to float on water. And then immediately I knew how to float on water. He now started teaching me how to sink. So it was so confusing. So uh, what I'm saying is that let us invest in our youth, giving them internship, volunteering positions, wherever we are in our organizations. Um, that was a trend that was coming through all the discussions. What I picked up from David Obura's uh, presentation that uh, I think uh, the county government of Mombasa has really been strongly represented here now by none other than the deputy governor and uh, two CECs, or, or how many? And then I was, there was a chief officer and several directors have been here. Uh, Dr. Bura was very clear that uh, we need to look at the landscape. Mombasa is a tiny island. Uh, we were given a a space of 200 square kilometers with a population of uh, 1.3 million. So it actually makes us the most densely populated county in Kenya. So even though we can keep on complaining about the problems within Mombasa, but know that the city is really struggling with serious issues and uh, we have a space, a very little space. So from Dr. Bura's presentation is that we should adopt an integrated approach in addressing our issues across the board. So we, we should try and have a, a connected approach instead of a compartmentalized approach. We last year initiated a forum which brings all the stakeholders together. It's an informal forum. It's not written in any constitution, but it really works well. In that forum, you'll get all the big NGOs in Mombasa working for the solutions of the city. And that is to connect the, the integrated approach. Then from the first panel that uh, were, were presenting, I, I think quite a number of things came up very clearly from, from their discussions. But uh, I was so impressed with the way they connected climate issues with the real problems they deal with in their situations. Many of them were not climate experts, but they are in CEOs in their organizations, whether it is in climate fin financing, whether it is in water, and so on. But they were able to connect the relevance of climate in their sectors, and what came out from that uh, panel discussion is that uh, climate is an overarching uh, concern that cuts across all the sectors and rightly put I, I think the Waziri in charge of climate was able to articulate how the county government of Mombasa has set up a mechanism where they have been able to put uh, climate considerations in the plannings in all the sectors which is a very good thing I keep on saying Mombasa is leading in some of these things but we like pushing the county to do better because even uh, there's this other Kenyan who was the fastest man on earth, but he said there was no limit to human beings, okay? Then he did less than two minutes. Is it two hours? Two, two hours. Yeah, so there's no reason why Mombasa should stay put and uh, not excel so that the West can come to Mombasa to copy how a sustainable city can be with all these problems. Uh, in the second panel, which I was part of, um, I was so much uh, impressed by the efforts that the community group is taking to address a problem which is, you can see it's well beyond their capacity to resolve, but they were not thinking that they, they are not able to resolve that. 
And what come up, comes up from that panel is that uh, we have to support the efforts of community members to integrate nature-based solutions in their actions. Actually, if somebody dug deeper into nature-based solutions, you'll find that most of these projects that we undertake, including road projects uh, that we are doing, they are to deal with issues of development to address the uh, vulnerability of the communities. So it is a solution for nature. So we need to help the community-based organizations by supporting them to be able to address the issues they have by improving on nature-based approaches. And finally, the, the panel that took it all, I think if we were awarding the panels was the youth panel. Uh, the energy, they were giving these points from their experiences, businesses which have been in existence for the last two years only, others three years, but the core is that they were established by young founders and uh, they have gone through a lot of uh, circumstances to excel. And what is clear is that from that panel is that the time is ripe for youth to take leadership in all the sections, uh, all the sectors, especially the climate change. So Basil, that is what I could remember. I'm lucky I've not dozed the whole day. So you can see, sorry? Ah, the play, the play. I, 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 do we have a recording of that play, honestly? The, whoever directed that play knew the behavior of mangrove and coral and that fish. That fish is very jumpy. If you go to the ocean, the fish that you'll find jumping over water, it exactly behaves like that fish. And the coral behaves like that when it has bleached. And it doesn't want to be told that it has bleached. And of course the mangroves that uh, <laughs> our friend was talking about, uh, the ones where we are brewing Chang'a, those mangroves have seen it all. Just here, across the bridge, you pass there every day across Nyali Bridge. The mangroves you see on the left and on the right, they are dens of serious stuff. And I, I think the, the story that they created, especially the human, <laughs> the human in that story, uh, took us exactly to the way we behave. So we, we, we should encourage that kind of uh, approach. And last year we attended a conference with, uh, with Basil and and my friend whom I was fearing he will ask me a question during the panel because he knows me a little bit and I can never answer his questions. So when he didn't answer, ask, I was very happy. But the thing that we learned from that conference, African Futures Conference, is that uh, art, art sends the message to the current generations better than the best report compiled by the best uh, scientists. And we were given an example of a guy who was trying to get the mayor to come and listen to a very critical report, and he could always send representatives. So the mayor says, well, So one day he got a card inviting him for a show, just like this one. And he asked if he could come with all his family and all his cabinet. And that's what the guys wanted, to send the message through art. So this play here, if there is any way we can support it to be performed in all environmental places, especially in schools, then we have a generation with a future. Thank you very much. That was a great summary, and it was attentive throughout. I was pretty sure he was attentive. So that was, uh, that, that was a very incredible session we've had today, and that brings us to the end of the second multi-sectoral climate roundtable, 2023. We couldn't do this without, of course, the Danish Embassy. We couldn't do this without the NIDA Fellowship uh, Center that empowered us with skills and gave us the opportunity to work on this project uh, coached by some Danish experts. And I'm glad that we, we continue to deliver it. 
Of course, Coco Networks are not here, but they were well uh, represented in the, in the panel. Bao Staka, Kenya Climate Innovation Center, Hivos, uh, Musk, Kefres, of course, Kodio East Africa, and Nema were here with us. And of course, Komsa, uh, not represented in the logos, but they've given us great insights in this event, and we look forward to working with them uh, 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 in the future. They brought in two people flown from Nairobi to just come and listen, and they've, they've, they've listened through uh, uh, this, this session, throughout the session. So we wrap it up at that. As we move out, I'm going to drop, I'm not going to speak after this, so I'm going to drop this mic uh, to the gentleman at the edge there. So all of us are going to stay there for a minute as we walk out to just listen to him and his uh, 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 exhibition, see what he's doing, and, and, and just uh, uh, maybe wow at it or just uh, give him some feedback later. So thank you all, and see you again soon. Look out for our newsletter that will be coming to your emails with all uh, whatever happened in this event, a recording to this event, and of course, a uh, uh, summary of uh, the key takeaways are summarized by uh, Dr. Angao. So thank you very much, and see you again next year. So it's okay. You can you can speak as as guys just come and converge there briefly as we walk out. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is John uh, Kalume Konde. I'm coming from uh, Kilifi North, uh, in a at a village called Dongokundu, which is along uh, Mida Creek. Uh, I'm a young entrepreneur. My business name is Nyukini Mali. Nyukini Mali is a uh, beekeeping business which manage uh